All right, so thanks for coming back. Um, so we're, we're going to be starting uh, the parallel session, and this is uh, just in case you're, uh, you want to make sure you're in the right place. This is for uh, four uh, talks on basketball. Um, so uh, chairing the session today, we have uh, none other, that's what it's called, none other than uh, Mike Zarin, who's, uh, are you assistant GM? Yeah, who's the assistant GM of the Boston Celtics, and also a uh, pretty smart quantitative guy. Uh, so let me introduce you. Thanks. So thanks, Mike. Um, so uh, welcome. Um, before introducing the first speaker, Mark just wanted me to make a quick um, say a quick thing about the data that's being used for three of these four uh, papers. Um, it's uh, the X Y data that's coming from Stats Inc. A sports View system that's been installed, I think, in, in ten or eleven NBA arenas last year. The, the league just did a deal with. Um, with stats, and it's going to be in all 30 arenas this year. And I've had some people even this morning ask me, well, what does this mean for the data that we're using to do these papers? Because before it was sort of provided to the researchers under agreement of the teams who were you know, uh, having the system installed in their arenas and Stats Inc. The deal with the league is sort of not clear yet on what uh, is going to happen with this data. So. I've talked to people on both sides uh, at the league and also at Stats, and, and both are still interested in researchers getting some access to this data, but what exactly that model looks like is, is still up for debate. So hopefully there'll still be a lot more of these papers. Um, but uh, I know some people at uh, some other teams who are here uh, are also going to be pushing the league to continue to make this data available uh, in appropriate research environments, so um, hopefully we'll still have it. But. Uh, for now, at least we get to enjoy the fruits of some people's labors with this data. Uh, the first guy who's presenting um, is uh, Dan is it Cervone. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> he's fine with that. Uh, Dan's beginning his fourth year as a PhD student here in the statistics department, studying with Carl Morris and uh, Nitesh Pillai. Carl's here at least, I saw him earlier somewhere. He's over there. Um, Prior to this, as an undergrad at uh, my alma mater, the University of Chicago, he assisted in the statistical research and modeling for the book Scorecasting, and he's now part of the XY Hoops working group here, which is led by Professor Luke Bourne, which focuses on spatial and spatio-temporal modeling of NBA optical tracking data. So, Dan. Okay, is this volume good? Can you guys hear me? Okay. I want to start just by acknowledging my collaborators on this project. Um, as Mike mentioned, the XY Hoops Research Group at Harvard, um, specifically Alex Damore, who's sort of my co-collaborator with this work, but unfortunately he can't be here today. So the title of my presentation is State of Transition, Estimating Real-Time Expected Possession Value in the NBA with a Spatial Temporal Transition Model in Player Tracking Data. So what do I mean by state of transition? Well, for a very long time, um, the metrics we've been using to analyze players and teams come from these databases that basically just have summary statistics of games, um, maybe summary statistics of possessions, like how many points were scored, and if an assist was made, who made it. And now we're moving to this optical tracking data. Um, and for the data set we have, we only have 515 games, which may not seem like as big of a database compared to something like, you know, you have tens of thousands of games in basketballreference.com. But the thing is that the resolution, the level of detail in each of these game files is incredibly high. So we have uh, Two-dimensional locations, XY locations, for all 10 players who are on the court. 3D location for the ball. And we have these 25 times per second. So in just these 515 games, this actually amounts to 800 million uh, XY or XYZ points in space time that we have. We also have some very useful external information, like um, annotations of when dribbles and passes and shots happen um, that are sort of hand-coded and entered by people who are watching the data, watching the game in, in real time. So what does this data actually look like? Uh, well, this is like basically one kind of sample from the data set. It looks a lot different from the data sets you probably use in RStudio or Revo or any of the other uh, software programs that sponsor this event. Um, so what we have here is this is a particular possession, uh, the, Oklahoma, the Oklahoma City Thunder at San Antonio Spurs. And the Spurs players are in red. We can see that Parker, Jackson, Green, Duncan, and Dia are on the court, and they're labeled with their numbers. That orange circle is the, the ball there, so Parker's got it basically at the top of the arc. Um, looks like a pretty standard you know, snapshot of something you might see during a possession. 
But of course, this isn't the only thing we see. We also see this moving in time. So let me um, give you a picture of what that looks like. This is the, from the same possession as it kind of evolves in real time. Um, we hope so. I mean, I mean, to like, to, you know, if it's to their left or right, I mean, even that level of accuracy. Yeah. So the data is like these locations are kind of like um, there are cameras that are on the court, and there's like a pre-processing routine that identifies like the ball and the players um, sort of as contrast points from the court surface. I'm not sure there's mechanical error in that, uh, but in theory it should be the exact location of the ball. Okay, so how does having data like this change the way we think about um, sort of quantifying value and possessions, or how, to, how can we analyze players differently with this data? So I'm gonna take this analogy, which I stole from Kirk Goldsberry, who's, who's here, um, which compares basketball possessions to chess matches. So the analogy goes like this. Uh, this is a sample of a game, a very famous game, actually, from 1851. Um, what can we learn about this chess match from the last move which in chess notation this says bishop moves to e7 checkmate. Well, not a whole lot, right? Because we don't know um, sort of whether white, so white wins, we know that. Uh, we don't know whether white kind of had the upper hand the whole game. Maybe there was a dramatic moment somewhere halfway in the game where sort of their fortunes were reversed. Maybe actually white played a, a bad game, but black made so many mistakes that white was still able to win. But perhaps most importantly, um, as many of you who who played chess know, uh, the checkmate itself, usually the move that corresponds to the checkmate isn't that interesting. It's usually the end product of a very tightly choreographed sequence of moves that began maybe eight moves earlier. And that's kind of where the game was really won, was eight or nine moves ago. And we don't see that when we look at the checkmate. So um, basketball, there's a similar phenomenon playing out. So of course, um, we obviously know we have value when the ball like goes into the net or doesn't go into the net, but there's also value that's created earlier times in the possession that we miss when we only look at those terminal events. So sometimes possessions are won or lost, or value is contributed to the possession like well before the shot actually happens. Some examples of this are, you know, if a teammate uh, eludes the defense and gets open in the paint, and then the player with the ball passes to him. Um, the ball carrier skips an easy shot to pass to a heavily defending teammate. This actually would be a loss of value, probably, because you're better off taking an easy shot than passing to somebody who doesn't have an open look. And lastly, this one's more subtle, but if there's no look at the basket and there are no easy passes, you can sort of create value by avoiding making a bad decision, such as shooting a crappy shot or passing somebody who isn't open. So the way we can sort of uh, quantify these, these kind of questions and answer them is by tracking the real-time expected possession value of an NBA possession. So if I imagine a particular possession, I'm going to call x the number of points that are scored in that possession. Um, and if time little t is like some time that's in the middle of that possession, I don't know what x is yet. But I can think about how many points will I expect to score, what's the expected value of x, conditional on everything I've seen in the possession up to time t. And so if we track the expected possession value throughout the course of the possession, um, we can learn things such as when and how value was created during the possession. Like when did we see the expected value spike up or something? Um, if it did spike up, who created that spike? You know, who made the decision that made the expected value increase? And then when we don't look at just specific games, but look at larger chunks of time, do players systematically make decisions that increase their team's expected points? Um, so breaking down expected possession value into its different components uh, gives us a way of sort of diagramming which decisions, possible co decisions, contribute to the value. So if you imagine that at a given time t, so the player with the ball is going to do something next. He's either going to dribble it somewhere or hang on to it. He's going to pass it, or he's going to take a shot. And each of these decisions has an expected value associated with it that's the result of that decision. 
And these things are highlighted in blue here. So these are basically assuming um, what's the, how many points do I expect to score right now if the guy takes a shot? And these probabilities here are what we think the chances of him actually making a shot at this particular time are. For instance, if, he's, if the guy's like way beyond the three-point arc, this is probably low, the expected value of a shot, just because it's a difficult shot. But also, the probability is pretty low because we're not going to, you know, we don't think he's going to take a shot from that far away. And the beauty of uh, sort of conditional probability is that if we just sort of take a weighted average of all of these things, that's exactly equal to the expected possession value. Um, no, this is actually true no matter how we define A. And so more than just a useful uh, sort of breakdown of the ingredients of expected possession value, this is actually more or less how we calculate it. Um, the next couple slides are going to go into the sort of gory details. Um, and I'll try and uh, not spend too much time on this stuff, because actually the methodology is pretty complicated. But the statisticians in the audience, uh, I think there's some pretty cool and innovative stuff here. So maybe we can talk about that afterwards. So um, the first thing we need to do, basically, is uh, create a state space at that sort of discretizes the full resolution spatial data. And we can see that as long as like S is a valid sample space, then this conditional expectation can be broken down um, as you know, weighted of average of all the, the states in that state space. And there's sort of like nothing interesting here. This is just basic conditional expectation. Um, now, the tricky part comes in actually choosing how you want to discretize the court. So what we want here is for this term over here, which is the expected possession value, given the full resolution spatial data up to right now, and also the decision I'm going to make in the next small chunk of time. I I'm hoping that that expected value is close to the expected value of the possession just given the decision. In other words, these state spaces here, uh, the information in these states, should have enough of the full resolution detail that if I just know what state I'm going to be in next, I don't really need to care about what the full court looks like right now. The other hope with our state space is that these quantities here, the expected possession value, just given the state that we're in or the state we're going to be in next, are easy to calculate, just maybe by empirical averages. Um, there's a little bit of a trade-off with these two steps, because the better, uh, so the finer we make our, our state space, the more states we have in it, um, the closer this approximation is going to be, and that the state that we're in has more and more spatial information in it. But then again, it's going to be harder and harder to compute these. You know, at the limit, if we just have our states kind of infinitely or as fine as the real data, then this actually reduces to our original problem of calculating expected possession value given the full resolution spatial data. The second step is uh, estimating these transition probabilities. Um, so to do that, we've actually defined S in a way such that in order to calculate the probabilities of transitioning into each of the states in S, we only need to calculate the um, probabilities of shots and pass events in the next like epsilon chunk of time. And we've created six different types of shot, uh, sorry, two different types of shot events, made or missed shots, four different pass events, one corresponding to each of the teammates. Um, and for each of these events, we assume that their occurrences follow an inhomogeneous Poisson process. And the rate of this Poisson process, there's a different rate for each event type and for each player who has the ball when you know, deciding what to do next. And the rate also depends on time, because the court dynamics are changing over time. So we additionally parameterize these Poisson in intensities. Um, so what we have here is basically there's W is like a time-referenced vector of covariates. So these are going to be things like, how close is the nearest defender to the player with the ball? Um, is the player with the ball dribbling? Is he moving fast? Things like that. And of course, beta are, are just the coefficients for those covariates. Zeta t is the, actual, is the actual xy location of the player with the ball at time t. Um, so this takes values on the space of the court. And h is a function that maps that position to a real number. And that real number contributes to this, uh, this log intensity of making this kind of event happen. So let's take a look at some of these surfaces when we actually fit them to players. Because I think the, the, the coefficients for the covariates are very interesting, but these are sort of um, 
the most interesting. So these are the spatial random effect surface for shot event types uh, broken down by player here. Um, so if we take a look at, for instance, uh, Tim Duncan here, we see that his shot intensity is highest like right when he's around the basket, which means basically like if he's around the basket, all other things being equal, there's a higher probability that he takes a shot in the next small chunk of time than any other, pla uh, any other place he is on the court. Um, in particular, what these are not plots of, these are not plots of how well people shoot from different areas. For instance, we see that in the post here, Tim Duncan is actually like super negative. You might think like, well, he should easily, I mean, maybe not easily, but he'll probably make 50% of the shots he takes from the post here. The reason why these are negative here is because if he's in the post with the ball, he's actually not very likely to take a shot. In most cases, he's going to sort of dribble in, into the paint here, into the restricted area, and try a layup or a dunk or something. So that's why these are negative. Um, similarly, if you look at Danny Green, uh, we see there's sort of a spike around the corner threes. He takes a lot of those. Um, also around the basket, you'd expect everybody to have a high intensity near the basket. Um, it's somewhat smooth throughout the perimeter, even though he doesn't take many shots there. But the reason why that is because he also doesn't spend much time possessing the ball there. Um, so, like, he doesn't have as many shots uh, in, in the perimeter as he does in the, beyond the three-point arc, but the spatial intensity still looks the same. And that's the reason, the reason for that is because when he has the ball and he's not in the paint or something, he's more likely to be just behind the three-point arc than he is in the perimeter. Now we can look at some of these uh, spatial random effects for the passing surfaces. These are a little bit different because in the model I actually have a surface for the sender and a surface for the receiver. And they just sort of add together when considering the overall spatial effect here. So uh, these are intensities for Parker passing to Duncan. Um, and we actually see that it's pretty smooth across the court. Um, if you look at, I mean, there's color differences, but if you look at the scale here, they're not very large. And there's, a lot of un there's some uncertainty here, which kind of weighs these out. For Duncan uh, receiving passes from Parker, we see that you know, if, Park, if uh, Duncan is in the post here, there's a higher probability that uh, Parker will pass, him, pass to him in a small chunk of time. And similarly, if we look over now to uh, Duncan passing to Parker, if he's in the post or in the paint, basically anywhere near the basket, he's very unlikely to pass the ball to Parker and, in, in fact, to anybody else. Really, the only place he, times he passes are when he's sort of out at the top of the arc here. And generally, when he's passing, and those passes go to Parker, they tend to go also around the perimeter. So let's put some of this stuff together and actually look at expected possession value at a certain point in time. So this is a frame from that video clip I showed you earlier. Um, we see. Uh, one here is Parker. He has the ball at the top of the arc. In blue here are the possible passes he could make to each of his teammates. And if we look on the right, where we break down the expected possession value, um, if we assume that he's going to make a pass, that that's the next he's going to be do, that's the next step he's going to do, then conditional on making a pass, this is the expected possession value. So 0.78 is the expected value uh, that we see if he passes to teammate two. Assuming he passes to two, that's how many points we're expected to score. And that's kind of low, basically, because uh, that's Steven Jackson. He's not really standing anywhere useful. Um, and correspondingly, he has a very low chance of actually making this pass, probably because there are a bunch of guys in the way. Um, Danny Green's in the best spot in terms of expected possession value, because he has a corner three. He's pretty wide open. That's pretty valuable. But there's only a, we're only saying there's a 14% chance he passes there, basically, because He's kind of far away, and there are guys in between. On the flip side, he's much more likely to pass to uh, Boris Dia or uh, Tim Duncan, these four and five guys here, because they're closer. And, and um, they're also standing in spots that are relatively neutral as far as expected possession value goes. Similarly, if we assume uh, Tony Parker takes a shot right now, the expected value of this uh, it's frame in time, conditional on him making a shot is the next thing he does. It's given by the probability that his shot goes in, which is 0.18, pretty low, seeing as it's beyond the three-point arc, times three points, which is how much that shot would be worth, plus 0.18, which is the value of a missed shot, because there's always the possibility of offensive rebound, 
times 0.82, what is the probability that he missed the shot? And so adding up all these different components, again, he's much more likely to pass, uh, probably because he's far away from the basket than he is to shoot. But when we add all these things together, we get 0.86, which is the expected possession value of this specific point in time. Of course, the cool thing is that we don't need to look at just this time. We can kind of see how this evolves in real time throughout the possessions. So that's what we're going to do here. Uh, this line here is the baseline expected value of any given possession. So when the Spurs have the ball, they're, they score about 0.85 points per possession. That number is lower than what you typically hear because we're removing free throws from our events. Free throws are about an additional 0.2. Um, this black dot here is tracking like the real-time expected possession value. Okay, taking a better look at that. Um, So this is actually that expected value point plotted over time of the possession right here. And these dots here sort of are annotating events. As you notice in the video, kind of nothing's really happening as Parker is just dribbling the ball around the perimeter. Um, over here is where he passes to Steven Jackson. The expected possession value when that happens is not very high because Steven Jackson is not a very good three-point shooter. And in fact, I don't know if you remember from the video, as soon as that pass happens, uh, there are two defenders who run over to Jackson to double team him, and on top of that, he actually walks, he's no, no longer in three point range, he actually walks to the perimeter. So that's a really crappy position to be in. But as Duncan sort of gets open near the post, this expected value starts to go up because we see, start to see the possibility of this pass to Duncan, who's in a high value place. Once the pass happens, the value only continues to go up because Duncan drives it to the basket for a pretty easy layup. When he takes the layup, this expected possession value is like 1.6. So that corresponds to like a 70% chance of making the layup. And we can, uh, yeah, okay. So um, we can sort of sum the changes in expected possession value uh, over for specific players over during the game and also over the course of the season to see kind of which players tend to make decisions that increase expected possession value. And so where do we think this is? Uh, moving forwards. Well, I think it provides some really powerful ways for understanding and quantifying NBA offenses, like understanding where value comes from, who contributes it, how they contribute it. Um, it allows us a way to kind of disentangle skill from decision making, because there are players who may not actually be good shooters or you know, fast runners or things like that, but they may have high expected possession value because they tend to make good decisions. Um, lastly, some future stuff that we want to do with this is incorporate more defensive information. Right now we have positions of defenders, but we don't have who they are. Um, so you could imagine if, you know, if you're being guarded by, say, Boris Dia, your expected possession value might be lower than if you're being guarded by Nano DiColo. Um, so that's where we want to take this project next. That's it. Questions? Yeah, we, we have time for a couple questions. It's Carolyn, right? Um, yeah. Okay. I, I was just wondering, so if, if you would have the ball in your hands and your teammate makes an excellent move towards the basket, that would increase your EPV, but who gets the credit for that? The person holding the ball or the person That's an excellent question. Um, so it does take some, a little bit of disentangling. Um, so like the naive thing to do is just whoever has the ball uh, when that decision is made. Um, but you could sort of think as like, you'd see the expected value actually increasing before the actual pass happens. And sort of that increase that's before the actual pass, then maybe you could attribute to Duncan, uh, like in that example that we just saw. Um, but it's a little bit difficult to disentangle those situations.
Yeah, we're taking that into account. So yeah, so this pass here. The reason why the probability of this pass is so low is because we see two guys are in the way. Well, this is just like one very split uh, section in time. Um, there's something I'm not quite mentioning here because it's a little bit nuanced, which is also uh, not doing anything with the ball. Um, so that's also a decision that people make that sort of scales into this uh, in a more complicated way. Um, but what you would take away from this is that if he had to either pass or shoot right now, he should pass. And indeed, like, because that is higher, expected value given pass is higher than given shot. And indeed, we anticipate that, he'll, that he will pass. That's why that probability is high. OK, one more. Turnovers, turnovers, turnovers are in here. They're not. They're used to calculate expected possession value, but I didn't show them just for simplicity. Oh, but that would be sort of another. That's another possible event that happens in here. Yeah, and we have that as part of EPV. It's actually done separate from the passes um, because the way that the database is annotated, it's kind of difficult to tell whether the turnover was a steal or whether it was a bad pass. But those are in there. He works for the Spurs. <laughs> <laughs>